Hello, and welcome to NHP's webinar on safety essentials. My name is Daniel Nathanson. I'm the commercial engineer at NHP Electrical Engineering, specializing in automation and integration products and solutions. This session is part two on our safety essential series. Last time in part one, we looked at the fundamentals of machine safety, such as safety categories and performance level, what makes a safety system safe and some of the basic concepts. This part, we take a closer look into some of the products you would typically find in a machine safety control system, and in particular, those which we at NHP can offer. Now, there are many, many, many safety related products on offer from NHP and Rockwell Automation, as you can see in the image. From light curtains and laser scanners, pressure sensitive mats and edges, interlock switches, guard locking devices, trapped keys, variable speed drives, contactors and relays, emergency stop devices, safety monitoring relays, PLCs, IO and encoders. This isn't even an exhaustive list and there's always something new and exciting in development. I'm sure we have the right product for your machine safety application. As we saw briefly in the last session, a safety control system can typically be broken down into three subsystems, namely the input, logic and output subsystems. All safety devices play at least one of these roles in a safety system. The input devices monitor what happens in the field. The logic devices process the information and determine what to do with it based on some program. And the output devices operate when commanded by the logic and actuate. This system in particular that I'm showing on the slide shows an emergency stop operator as the input, a safety monitoring relay as the logic, and a pair of safety contactors as the output. The safety monitoring relay determines if and when the emergency stop button is pressed and de-energizes the safety contactors to remove power from the machine. Most safety control systems don't get any more complex than this, but with the advancement of technologies, we can do so much more with our safety control systems to help increase productivity rather than hinder it. The variety of different input devices, and we'll have a look at, uh, we'll have a quick look at through some of the major types, how and why they're used, and a brief overview on what's on offer. Firstly, we'll look at interlock switches. These are commonly used on removable guards on machinery and are used to monitor whether the guard is in place or not. If the guard is removed or is left open, the machine is not allowed to operate in a hazardous manner. Thus, the interlock switch is used in the machine control system to provide, as its namesake, interlocking to, provide, to prevent the machine, rather, typically from energizing whilst the guard is left open. As you can see from the image on the left, we have a typical installation with a tongue interlock switch monitoring a sliding guard. Note the tongue actuator on the sliding guard. When the guard is closed, the actuator enters the switch and closes its contacts, allowing the machine to operate. When the guard is then slid open, the actuator is removed and the contacts open, and the machine turns off, making it safe for someone to work on the machine while the guard is open. There are quite a few different ways to select the type of interlock device for your application, and there are standards to assist you, but I find the simplest way is as follows. First, is locking required? Does the guard need to be physically locked closed to prevent someone from opening it? For example, if the guard was to be opened while the machine was running and the hazard doesn't stop immediately, then you would look at guard interlocking switches. Otherwise, if locking isn't required, are there any alignment or ingress issues which are foreseeable? Perhaps a non-contact interlock switch is most suitable, as these are entirely sealed and ideal for dusty or clean in place applications. And finally in the selection, we have tongue interlocks. Whilst we're on the topic, we should look at tongue interlock switches first. As mentioned, they use a physical actuator key, which is inserted into the switch to close the safety contacts. When the actuator is removed, the cam arrangement inside the switch forcibly opens the contacts to remove power from the safety control circuit. This ensures that even if the contacts are stuck closed due to corrosion or welding, etc., the force of physically removing the actuator is enough to break the contacts open. The actuator itself is a special shape, such that only the actuator can enter the switch. That is, you can't stick a screwdriver or a metal shim or something similar into the switch to force the contacts closed. It needs to be this special shape. The Guardmaster range of tongue interlock switches come in a variety of sizes to suit most applications. The Elf Miniature and Cadet 3 are some of the smallest of its kind currently available, and they're ideal for small machines such as printers, copiers and domestic machinery, which until now have been able, unable to use safety interlocks due to space constraints. The MTGD2, a strong metal construction and versatile, can be used in most applications and use a larger industry standard fixing centre. This is to the standard DIN or EN50041, uh, which is a uh, typical limit switch dimension size. These first three styles have removable and rotatable heads, which provide eight possible actuator entry points, and also offer a GD2 reinforced actuator entry slot option for more physically demanding applications. The Trojan 5 and 6 and T15 switches, dual key entry slots and rotatable heads. 
movable only by releasing the cover screws. These switches offer four actuator entry options. The difference between these two are the physical dimensions and may require one or the other depending on the mounting constraints. As with the other series, these also offer a GD2 style slot head for arduous applications. Note, these devices do not lock the guard closed with a locking function. They are only there to check to see whether or not the guard is open or if it's closed. They don't prevent the guard from opening. This is why we have guard interlock switches. These operate in a similar manner to the tongue interlock in that they monitor if a guard is open or closed, but they also provide additional functionality as means of locking the guard closed during hazardous operation. They allow unlocking of the guard through energizing or de-energizing a solenoid, which releases the actuator. You typically use these to protect hazardous areas where a danger is not immediately removed after a stop request, as on many machines, removing power to the motor or actuator will not immediately stop the dangerous motion, it might keep going. Typical applications are high inertia loads, like fast rotating machines or machines where high pressure needs to be released from pneumatic valves. Also in the Guardmaster series, a variety of different style guard interlocks to cater for most applications. The Atlas V guard locking switch has a heavy duty die cast alloy housing and a patented self aligning head. It also provides one of the highest holding forces of up to 5,000 newtons, that's nearly 500 kilograms of force. The 440 GMT solenoid switch has a holding force of 1600 newtons and also features a heavy duty die cast alloy housing. They're smaller than the Atlas, but quite tough. They also have a removable and rotatable head, providing up to eight different actuator positions. The MT solenoid is also unique in that it does not provide separate solenoid and actuator contact sets, as you can see in the uh, diagram above. Rather, one set of contacts is operated by both solenoid and actuator ensuring that the safety contacts are closed only when both the actuator is inserted and it's locked. The TLS GD2 feature a high holding force of up to 2000 newtons. This is actually achieved by a set of locking pins which are mounted through the body of the switch and into the guard frame that it's mounted to. It's also got a rotatable head, so four possible key entry slots. There's also an escape release option, which is used for full body access applications where there might be a risk that a person could be locked inside a guarded area. What you don't want is someone locked into an area and then they can't get out because they don't have access to unlock the guard. So what you can do is add a cable attachment to the side of the switch, which pushes onto the locking pin and then releases the actuator. And this should only be accessible from the inside of the guarded area. The LZ guard locking switch combines microprocessor technology with an RFID coded actuator, and it features a locking bolt drive mechanism that locks only when the correct actuator is detected. With this functionality, the switch is also TEV certified for up to performance level E, which is the highest level of safety for guard door position and lock monitoring. It also offers RFID standard coded uh, actuators or uniquely coded actuators. The TLS ZGD2, similar to the LZ that it's got a uniquely coded RFID door sensor with an inductive door position sensing technology, but in the same physical style as the TLS GD2, which also provides the same holding force. This switch can detect if an actuator key breaks or becomes separated from the door mounted position because you can see from the actuator it contains a tongue actuator with an RFID tag next to it. If the tongue was to break off, the RFID tag is still being monitored by the switch, so if the guard is removed, the RFID tag is also removed and thus trips the safety system. It's also built with the same solid state tech as the LZ and supports the highest level of safety performance level E. Both the LZ and the TLS ZGD2 use the solid state safety outputs instead of traditional electromechanical contacts and have built-in diagnostics and fault detection. They are effectively their own little safety control system in their own right. Trap key interlock switches allow access to hazardous areas only when an appropriate key is inserted into the lock. These are an absolutely fantastic mechanical alternative to an otherwise electrical safety system. They're constructed of stainless steel and they provide a rugged industrial grade method of helping prevent access through the gates. As I said, they offer an excellent mechanical alternative where running wiring to the guard interlock is otherwise impracticable or a forced sequence of events is required before access to a guarded area is permissible without needing an electronic programmable logic controller or anything like that. The guard locks themselves come in a variety of different styles to suit any application and guard type. There are access lever and chain types, which are actuated by a lever or a rod that's inserted into, uh, that's inserted into the switch and connected by a chain, whereas the Schalt bolt type extends or retracts a bolt directly into the guard or a cam. Slam locks, which look a bit like the tongue interlock switches, combine the feature of a trap key with a tongue actuated interlock. They're available in purely mechanical versions. 
You can also get electrical and solenoid versions with contacts, which can provide an electrical feedback into a safety control system. All the lock styles come in either a single or a multiple key versions to allow for different actual action sequences. For example, a dual key version may require two keys to be inserted before unlocking, or maybe require one key to be inserted and then a second key released, which the user will then take with them into the guarded area. This is a personnel key, and as long as the person has it with them, it prevents the guard from being locked behind them. They need to return that key into the lock in order to close the gate. Exchange units for trap key switches are used in an interlocking sequence to link together other devices in the ProSafe range. These units cater to more complex operating sequences. There are effectively multiple keys in or multiple keys out. So you take perhaps one key in from an isolator and then that releases five separate keys which can be open, used to open up multiple guards. And the sequence works in reverse. You need to have multiple guards locked and the keys returned before you can then take a single key out and turn an isolator back on again. The rotary interlock switches are also isolation devices. They're used to isolate the machinery to improve the safe access, and they can also be used as teach boxes for robot cells. So once the power has been turned off, the key can, get, can be withdrawn and used in the net sequence of operations, such as unlocking an access hatch or allowing valves to be operated or taking into a key exchange system. The rotary switch can be mounted in a panel, or you can also get it pre-mounted in an enclosure. There are also solenoid release units, which also electrically isolate the machinery. They consist of a rotary power switch and a solenoid. The trap key it can only be removed once you send an external signal uh, to a solenoid which unlocks the cam and then the key can be removed. Once the key is removed, it performs an isolation. There's an indicator light on the solenoid unit which shows when the trap key can be removed. That is, when power is applied to the solenoid. The solenoid signal only needs to be present when the key removal is necessary. Once the key is taken out, you can de-energize the solenoid. The electronic time delay units are used in applications that require an elapsed time to occur before allowing access to a hazardous area. This interlock switch uses a time delay safety relay combination to execute a timing sequence. Turning a non-removable key initiates the timer. After timing out, its output energizes and an internal solenoid which then allows the removal of either one of the two trap keys. There are also a stop motion unit used in a similar fashion, but this uses inductive proximity sensors to detect the standstill of a, of a machine before allowing the release of a key. And finally, we also have switch gear adapters, which can be used to interlock third-party switch gear uh, and other host equipment, such as uh, air circuit breakers, load brake switches, molded case circuit breakers, etc. When power is isolated and locked off with the key, uh, you can then take the key out and then use it in the next sequence of operation. Non-contact switches are a great alternative to tongue interlock switches in that there's no physical contact required between the switch and the actuator. This allows them to be fully sealed from dust ingress and excellent for guards with poor or unreliable alignment. The sensor guard non-contact switches feature the latest generation of RFID technology for coding and also inductive technology for sensing. This is the same technology used in the LZ and the TLSZ guard interlock switches which I mentioned earlier. They're also TEV certified up to performance level E as the highest level of safety. They've got a large sensing range and tolerance to misalignment and they're a reasonably cost effective solution for a wide range of industrial safety applications. Provided, it also provides switches that can be connected in series with other devices, and they come in a variety of different styles, including flat pack, barrel plastic, and stainless steel housings, and also offer magnetic hold and integrated latch versions. One of the best features of the sensor guard range is the ability to daisy chain each unit to the next and still allow for individual monitoring of each guard. If one guard in the chain is opened or that switch has failed, you can use the LED status of each to determine where in the chain the failure has occurred. The magnetically coded utilize read contacts with a specially coded actuator. This prevents defeat with a typical magnet. This is because the actuator is a series of north and south pole magnets, which can only be used with that particular switch. The Ferragard family of non-contact switches are a more traditional magnetic read contact style, but don't use coded magnets. The Ferragard GD2 on the right there in particular is the most arduous of applications. It uses a full stainless steel housing for added protection against impact and also has the widest temperature range than any of the plastic Ferragard switches. That's minus 25 degrees up to 125 degrees Celsius. Safety limit switches are a bit older tech used for guard monitoring, but they're still quite versatile in their application. As a result, there are many, many different shapes and sizes and actuator styles available. 
Typically, these are found in pairs for redundant safety systems, with one contact being used for each rather than one switch with two contacts in use. As you can see from my diagram at the top there with an example of a guard, we have two limit switches being used on the same guard. One of them is being held closed and the other open while the guard is closed. And then when you open the guard, the contacts change. The 440p limit, switches, limit switch family offers a full range of IEC style solutions for both safety and standard sensing applications. This family of limit switches are available in four different body styles, 30mm metal, 22mm metal and plastic, and 15mm plastic, the little baby ones. These switches offer a broad selection of operator types, circuit arrangements and connection options. The 440p is ideal for a wide variety of general purpose and safety guarding applications. The 802T series switches have the same mounting dimensions as other NEMA style switches. They're a rugged metal construction and plug-in body. Uh, they're designed for use in harsh industrial environments. So to this point, we've been looking at devices for monitoring guards, which are fixed or movable in place. But we also have presence sensing devices. These are devices that don't actually guard the machine uh, physically from people. They are only there to detect the presence of people. And there's multiple ways to do this. In this example, we have safety mats. These safety mats are pressure sensitive safeguarding devices, and they're used to detect the presence of people who stand on the sensing surface. The mats are constructed of two hardened steel plates that are held, to, held apart with non-conductive compressible separators. So when you step on them, the two plates come in contact and there's a short circuit that occurs between the two, between the two plates, each of which are monitored by their own safety circuit. An appropriately configured safety monitoring relay or a PLC will recognize this cross-channel short, not as a fault, but as an actual safety function. Safety mats don't perform any actual physical guarding as such, as I mentioned, so you needed to take into account the stopping time of the machine and the size of the area monitored by the safety mat. Now, because of the cross-channel monitoring being recognized as a demand, not a fault, this means that if a real cross-channel wiring fault were to occur, it wouldn't necessarily be detected as a fault. So for this reason, safety mats can only be used in safety control systems up to category three. Safety mats come in a variety of different shapes and sizes, and you can join them together to form an arrangement around a machine or an area. The mats need to be secured to the floor. This is to prevent someone from lifting the mat up and moving it elsewhere, so edge trims are required. The trim also doubles as a cable channel to allow for safe routing of the wiring to the safety mats. Safety edges are also pressurized, say, pr sorry, pressure sensitive safeguarding products. They're designed to detect the presence of people on the sensing surface. They work in a similar way to safety mats in that when a person or object comes in contact with the edge, it compresses two conductive rubber layers, which create a low resistance channel short and trip the safety control system. Safe edges are, as their name implies, used on the edges of machinery or other physical objects, which are positioned so as a person will come in contact with the safety edge first before reaching further into the hazard. Roller doors are a great application example. If a roller door comes down and there's a safety edge on the underside of it and it makes contact with someone or something, the safe edge is compressed and trips the safety system, either halting the roller door motor or you could get smart and have the safety control system reverse the motor to pull the door back up after coming into contact. The safe edges come in a variety of different shapes and sizes, which you would select based on the cushioning factor and angle of actuation. You can also get versions with sealing lips, which are perfect for the roller door application I just mentioned where the lip is on the outside of the door and helps prevent rain and dust seeping through beneath the edge. Safety light curtains are photoelectric presence sensors. They're designed to protect personnel from injuries related to hazardous machine motion. They do this by providing a series of infrared beams across an access area. The beams, can be tight, well, the beams are tightly grouped together, so they detect something as small as a finger passing through them. When a single beam is broken, it de-energizes the output and trips the safety control circuit. Light curtains offer optimal safety, yet they allow for greater productivity and are the more ergonomically sound solution when compared to mechanical guards. In the range include the point of operation control, POC models, for finger and hand protection, and perimeter access control products for whole body detection. The new 450L series in particular, they're unlike any traditional safety light curtain, which are based on a separate transmitter and receiver unit. Instead, each transceiver can be used as either a transmitter or receiver via a pair of plug-in modules. And you assign the transmitter or receiver function on the plug-in module using onboard dip switches. The 450LB is the basic model with on-off functionality, but there's also an advanced 450LE model, which features integrated laser alignment, cascading, blanking, and integrated muting. 
The 450L Light Curtains come in a wide range of protection heights, 150 up to just under 200, sorry, 2000 millimeter in, in increments of 150 millimeters. So that's 150 mil up to nearly two meters. And in 15 millimeter beam resolution for finger detection, finger detection, sorry, or 30 millimeter resolution for hand detection. The selection of either is important to consider how far back the light curtains are mounted from the hazard and the stopping time. The 450L series are capable of up to safety category 4 performance level E in SIL 3, which is the highest safety rating, and like the sensor guard non-contact switches, are self-diagnosing with monitored solid state outputs. You can mount light curtains in all sorts of arrangements, typically mounted vertically as shown in the image here to prevent someone from reaching into a hazard, but you can also mount them horizontally to act almost like a safety mat to protect someone standing in an area. This is advantageous where safety mats aren't physically practical due to perhaps a cleaning environment or there are vehicles in the area which might run onto the mat that are too heavy. However, you are limited to the rectangular area monitored by the beams. You can't get too fancy with the, uh, with the size and shape of the area. Hence, laser scanners. They're quite a unique product. They give you the ability of being able to monitor a 2D area like you would with a light curtain or safety mat, but they give you the benefit of it being completely non-touch and fully configurable. The area which is monitored can be drawn up using configuration software to any shape and can extend out over a large area depending on the model. Laser scanners work like a diffuse photo sensor in that it works on pulsing out a laser beam and measuring how much light is reflected back to determine if an object is there, but also calculates the time taken for the light to reflect back to determine the distance to the object. This is called time of flight. But unlike a diffuse photo sensor, the laser beam sweeps across a large area giving you a two-dimensional zone of measurement. The Safe Zone series laser scanners come in various flavors, including the multi zone version, which has switchable configurable field sets, warning, and safety. So you can have different zones mapped out, which can be switched out on the fly using digital inputs. This means you can have, for example, up to four different safety zones that are mapped out, and then depending on the application or the process, you just change a few of the digital inputs, and the entire area is changed out automatically. The Safety Configuration and Diagnostic Software, SCD, is supplied with each scanner and simplifies the programming of the safe zone. A configuration wizard is available to guide the programmer through simple or complex safety configurations. Some of the various options offer 190 or 270 degree scan angles, and they provide from 2 meter up to 5 meter safety field ranges and even further for the warning fields. This also includes a configurable resolution between 30 and 150 millimeters. Like light curtains, they can be mounted vertically or horizontally, and you can have multiple scanners situated around an area in order to detect all around a machine or in tricky locations. Encoders can be used for safety applications that require speed, direction, or position monitoring safety functions. For example, if you need to monitor the speed of a rotating machine like a saw blade, you can control when the guards may be unlocked for people to enter the area. Or perhaps whilst a person is performing maintenance on a machine, they need to ensure the machine is operating in a safe speed, but also perhaps in a safe direction. Encoders are essential for such applications as they are mechanically fixed to the rotating parts of the machine and provide direct velocity and position feedback. Up until this point, encoders used for safety applications were essentially just standard encoders providing feedback into a dedicated safety control relay or a safety module on a drive which for the high safety ratings needed things like two different types of encoders working in parallel or additional wiring and fault tolerance, etc. Now we have the luxury of a fully capable safety rated encoder, the 843ES, which operates entirely over ethernet IP, drastically simplifying the whole process. These safety encoders support the GuardLogic's controller-based safety functions in Studio 5000 by providing auxiliary feedback directly through an ethernet IP network on SIP safety it makes it so much easier to achieve the desired safety integrity or performance level by reducing the number of components needed and utilizing the already available advanced drive safety instructions. It features <clears throat> suitable for safety ratings up to including category three, performance level E and SIL three. They come in various different shaft and mounting arrangements, including clamping, synchro, square flange options, or solid shaft or blind hollow shaft. Dual Ethernet ports with embedded Ethernet IP switch for linear networks or device level ring topologies. They're good for up to IP67 for washdown. And they're fully configurable resolution and scaling in Studio 5000 and they support single or multi-turn applications. One of the most commonly sought after safety device is the humble emergency stop operator because it is a necessary requirement for all machines which have some level of operator interface. What's often overlooked, however, is that it's a complementary device only. 
It doesn't perform any actual safeguarding, which is why you may still require interlock guards. Nonetheless, they're still a critical part of any machine safety control system. Emergency stop operators come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but always latching, red in colour, and with a contrasting background. They always have at least one normally closed contact, and depending on the safety rating, two normally closed contacts. Some of the options include twist to release or pull to release, with the former most common, key reset or padlockable, plastic or metal, with an LED indicator or without, 20 or 30 mil sizing. You can get them as standalone modular, operator and separate contact blocks, or as a pre-built enclosed e-stop station. The options for the contact blocks also include an innovative self-monitoring type, which automatically opens the contacts if the contact block comes away from the operator head, if it falls off, for example. In some of the larger e-stop options, uh, for heavy industrial applications, there are also late break contacts, which are great in situations of high vibration, as they can prevent nuisance stripping from the contacts jiggling around. Sometimes though, for larger machines, it's impractical to put an e-stop station within arm's reach all around the machine. Think of a 100 meter long conveyor where you need to have an emergency stop all along the entire length. So in the emergency stop devices family, there are pull wire switches. These operate by having a long cable or a rope which follows the profile of the machine. Pulling on the cable in any direction at any point along its length will trip the switch and trip the safety control system. The cable is constantly under tension as well, so that if a break in the cable is, is detected by the pull wire switch, it will also trip the safety system. On the other end of the cable, you'll find either a second switch or a compensation spring. Both options are perfectly valid and they're essential to ensure that the cable is pulled in any direction will trip the switch. You can't have it firmly anchored on one end, for example. Inside the switch are a series of contacts, the same you'd find in any emergency stop operator station. Typically at least one normally closed contact, again two for high integrity systems, and a variety of additional normally open and normally closed for auxiliary functions. The exception to this is the Lifeline 5 pull wire switch, which is entirely solid state. Instead of the cable pulling the contacts open directly, it pulls on a digital way scale. One of the main advantages of, the, of this feature is that the Lifeline 5 can actively monitor and detect and compensate for any changes to the cable tension due to things like temperature and humidity, which in a mechanical operation, uh, would constantly require retensioning by maintenance personnel. Pull wire switches can typically span lengths of up to 100 meters for single sided and up to 200 meters for double sided operation. We can provide the cable in either a red PVC coated steel wire or a nylon fiber rope, which we call Tuflex, which is also color fast in UV, by the way. And all of the mounting pieces, even corner pulleys, to allow the cable to go around bends without affecting the tension or performance of the cable. And finally, for input devices, the grip switch, which can be used as part of the conditions to allow safe working inside a machine guard. These are used typically when you need to enter a guarded area but still have the machine operate, perhaps maybe under a safe speed, or you need to have quick access in order to turn the machine off. This is done by squeezing the trigger uh, to enable the machine to work and then releasing it to turn it off. Uh, some additional models are available with an optional jog button or a dual channel e-stop button. To this point, we looked at the safety input devices, and there are a lot of them. In fact, it was more than half of this entire presentation. But now we move on to the brains of the safety operation, the logic devices, and these come in a wide variety of complexity, from simple single function safety relays to fully fledged PLCs with both standard and safety functionality. Safety relays check and monitor the safety system and either allow the machine to start or execute commands to stop the machine. Single function safety relays are the most economical solution for small machines where a dedicated logic device is needed to complete the safety function. More modular and configurable safety relays are preferred where a large and diverse number of guarding devices and minimal zone control is required. Our Guardmaster Single Function Safety Relays, or GSRs, come in a range of key functions to simplify installation and system complexity. The SI and the CI provide input for a single device with minimal logic, whereas the DI and DIS provide inputs for two different devices, as well as a link from an upstream GSR. This is to allow you to do some unique logic with several GSRs daisy chained together. This is also called single wire safety. For example, you can produce an e-stop hierarchy with a global e-stop at the start of the chain, which shuts down the entire run, or downstream e-stops which shut down specific sections of the machine. This ensures a reduction of unnecessary downtime by shutting down processes that really don't need to be. The EM and EMD are expansion relays to provide additional outputs. The latter also provides a time delay function. These are used in conjunction with the other GSR relays to provide extra outputs. 
The GLT and the GLP are specifically designed for guard locking applications, which interface with the guard interlocking device and control when the guard can be unlocked, either with a time delay with the GLT or speed monitoring with two PNP proxy sensors, the GLP. There is also the DG Guard Link safety relay, which further extends the capability to share diagnostics and status information of the individual safety devices on a proprietary device level comms protocol. This is called Guard Link. This is a fairly new uh, device, which is incredibly versatile. And lastly, the optional Ethernet IP interface module. It can be used to gather further diagnostic information from up to six different GSR relays mounted next to each other, and can also be used to issue non-safety commands to the DG relay, such as lock and unlock and reset commands. Configurable safety relays, in this case the 440C CR30, are ideal for more complex safety applications requiring as many as 10 dual channel safety circuits and controlling as many as five output zones. Typically, the rule of thumb is if you need more than three safety monitoring relays for your application, then you would benefit from a single CR30. It's programmed within Connected Components Workbench, which is free software, and it's done by simply selecting certified safety function blocks and linking them together to create your logic. The CR30 relay can share non-safety information with the, plug with the rest of the control system through an optional Ethernet IP plugin module. They're suitable for applications up to CAT4, PLE, and SIL3. They offer up to 22-point embedded safety I.O. And you can expand the non-safety I.O. using normal Micro 800 plugin modules. You'll even note that the CR30 looks a bit like a Micro 800 PLC. That's because they also share the same uh, plugin module accessories. It also provides embedded comms of a USB programming port and also an RS-232 serial port. It also includes two single wire safety input output points for interlocking between other GSRs or other CR30s. So moving on to the Premier integration side of things, a safety PLC system brings the benefits of traditional PLC to complex safety applications, replacing the hardwired relay systems. Safety PLCs allow standard and safety related programs to reside in a single controller chassis. They provide great flexibility in programming as well as a familiar and easy to use environment for programmers. Like the CR30, they utilize pre-certified safety function blocks. However, they're programmed using ladder logic and tag based structure. This is much more familiar territory for people already experienced in the logics environment and integrates very well into the rest of the logic and factory talk environments. The safety PLCs exist in the Guard Logic series, which utilize the same control logics chassis and form factor, as well as all of the networking and I.O. accessories in the same range. A single primary Guard Logics controller can support up to PLD SIL2. However, by adding a safety partner, you can achieve the highest safety ratings up to PLE SIL3. You can utilize the on-chassis safety or standard I.O. and or remote I.O. via SIP safety over Ethernet. For example, the new Flex 5000 series, Point I.O., Guard I.O., etc. There's also the Compact Guard Logic Safety PLCs, which take the same form factor as the standard Compact Logic series. Same benefits apply with the Guard Logics. You can utilize the on-chassis or remote standard and safety I.O. and accessories. However, the safety rating is fixed for the particular model. That is, you can't expand the safety rating using an additional safety partner. In both Guard Logics and Compact Guard Logics ranges, they come in various form factors, memory capacities, networking, and also motion options as well. And so arguably one of the most important components of any safety control system are the output devices, which are used to actuate the safety function and bring the machine to a safe state. This can be done using contactors and control relays to isolate power to the machine or through variable speed drive or a servo drive to bring the machine safely to a controlled stop or for more advanced processes, keep the machine running at a safe speed and direction or hold it in a safe position. Contactors are one of the best methods of ensuring that the electrical power to the machine is isolated. A safety contactor in particular provides some additional benefits which make them especially useful in machine safety applications. For the highest safety rated control systems, you would typically find two safety contactors operating in series. This is so that in the event that one contactor fails, the second contactor can still isolate the load, but you must be able to detect this failure. And so, safety contactors are provided with mechanically linked auxiliary contacts. These are used to provide feedback to the safety control system as to whether the contactor has successfully opened on demand. If one or more of the main contactor poles remains in the closed position, for example, due to a welded contact, mechanical damage, ingress, or even an electrical fault in the coil keeping it energized, the mechanically linked contact, which is directly linked to the main poles, will be held open. 
The safety control system will see this contact stuck in the open position and will thus detect that the contactor has not performed as expected. On some larger safety contactors, you will find instead a mirrored contact. The principle of operation is effectively the same as a mechanically linked. The only difference is that the mirrored contacts only represent the status of the main poles, but not vice versa. That is, a stuck mirrored contact does not hold the main poles in a certain state, whereas mechanically linked will. Furthermore, a safety contactor is beneficial over a standard contactor in that they've been specifically tested and certified by independent third-party organizations for machine safety and carry with them safety performance data, which is essential in performing performance level or SIL reliability calculations. Standard contactors simply don't have this benefit. So contactors are used to completely isolate the electrical load, but in many applications this may not be the best practice, if not for safety reasons such as letting a machine coast to stop with a high inertia load, but for negatively impacting process and production performance whenever a safety function is demanded. What you don't want to happen, for example, is for an entire batch of product to be damaged in the middle of a process because the machine got disconnected by the safety demand. You may perhaps want to induce a controlled safety stop or bring the machine to a safe position such that allows the machine to be restarted easily once the safety function has been cleared. Or maybe you don't want the machine to be completely isolated because you need power to operate it, for example, during maintenance, cleaning, or reprogramming. The variable speed drive is perfect for such applications, but you need safe but you need safety to be maintained. All safety drives feature, have a feature called safe torque off, which, features, which prevents the motor from producing any torque. This is typically done after a controlled ramp to stop, and depending on the drive model is done either by hardwired safety inputs or via SIP safety over Ethernet IP. Some more advanced models can also perform additional motion safety instructions internally, such as safe speed, safe acceleration or deceleration, safe position, safe direction with the aid of encoders. So we should have a good grasp on what's available in safety products. Now it's, a now it's time to look at some examples on how these are used and connected together. In this example, we have an emergency stop operator which, when pressed, de-energizes a motor via a variable speed drive. The emergency stop button in this example has two self-monitoring normally closed contact blocks which are operating in dual channel redundancy. These are being monitored by a GSR single input safety monitoring relay. The outputs of the relay are controlling the power supply to the drive, and specifically the gate control circuit, which performs the safe talk off function. For the operating, press the reset button to turn on the safety relay outputs. The drive is then enabled and power is applied to the start stop buttons. You can then start the machine normally pressing the start button. Pressing the stop button will stop the motor for normal production stops, but when you press the E stop to initiate a safety stop, it disconnects the gate control circuit and the motor then coasts to a stop. In this example, we have a similar safe stop application. This time, however, it involves a light curtain pair. The transmitter and receiver of the light curtains are powered by 24 volts DC, and there are two solid state outputs going into a GSR monitoring relay. The output of this relay is controlling the coils of two safety contactors, which are used to control and isolate the motor. Note on the contactors, there are the mechanically linked contacts, which are feeding back into the safety relay. Recall, these contacts are used to determine whether the contactors have opened on demand or not. To start the machine, you press the start button to energize the contact to K2. The motor then starts with the two normally open contacts of K1 and K2 holding the circuit energized. Obstructing the light curtain at any point de-energizes the safety outputs on the DI relay, which in turn drops out K1 and K2. The contactors disconnect the motor from its power source and the motor coasts to a stop. Clearing the obstruction from the light curtain doesn't cause the motor to restart again, it's, you still need to press the start button. And in our last example, this one is a bit more complex. This is an example of a guard locking function that utilizes a time delay to determine when the guard can be opened. On the left, there is a guard interlock switch with a pair of normally closed contacts, a pair each for the, con for the tongue actuator and for the solenoid. These are fed in series to a GSR GLT, which is a specialized safety monitoring relay for guard locking applications that use a time delay. There's several outputs from this relay. Two of them are controlling the safe torque off inputs to the drive, that's terminals 14 and 24 and the other two are operating the solenoid and the guard interlock switch. That's terminals 51 and L61. To start the machine, you press the door lock and reset request. After verifying that the gate is closed and locked, the GLT safety relay turns on outputs 14 and 24. The drive is enabled. You can then press the start button to start the motor. When access is needed through the safety gate, you just need to press the door unlock request button. The outputs 14 and 24 turn off immediately and the drive initiates a stop. 
After seven seconds, the GLT relay applies power to terminals 51 and L61 to unlock the gate. And so concludes today's presentation on safety products. By now you should have an appreciation for the depth of different safety products and their capabilities and have some idea on how they're used for different safety applications. For more information on the selection or even just on machine safety in general, there is a wealth of information available in the NHP Machine Safety Selection Guide. I also highly recommend reading through the Rockwell Automation Machinery Safe Book 5, which is a bit more advanced but provides fantastic guidance around designing and navigating machine safety control systems. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. I hope you found it beneficial, and if you'd like to watch it again or to find more webinars in this series, please go to nhp.com.au or our dedicated NHP YouTube channel. If you have any further questions about machine safety products and solutions, please contact your local NHP sales representative. With smarter and faster decision making and seamless connectivity spurring new collaboration, NHP is enabling the connected enterprise. Thank you for your time.